We're in the book of Romans, and we're in kind of a very unusual place. You know, one of the things that pastors occupy themselves with is um, the Bible and reading the Bible and teaching the Bible to others. And the danger of reading the Bible and only thinking that it has application to somebody else. We have sort of some misconceptions about the Bible. Uh, one of the misconceptions is that it was a love letter written by God to us. You've probably heard that before. The Bible is a love letter written by God to us. And as I love to contradict common thinking, I want to tell you that that is actually not true. It is not a love letter written by God to us. It is a series of letters written by God, as it were, through the pen or hand of men to others. For example, if you're reading the book of Hebrews, it's written to the Hebrews. It was written to the Hebrews in the first century. If you are reading the book of Daniel and you hear the words that is communicated uh, to Daniel, we know that was for the children of Judah and their departure from Babylon. But that does not mean that when we read the Bible that it does not have application to us. That there are things that we can learn from it. As the Bible tells us very clearly that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or woman of God may be perfect, mature, complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And so we can study the Bible and we can see how God was communicating via the prophets to others but we can't divorce ourselves from the fact that God is still, nonetheless, speaking to us. Well, that's kind of where we are. And in the middle of all that kind of conversation, and by the way, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Um, a couple of you do anyway. Thank, thank you for those of you that are, because I know what will happen. I'm going to get a bunch of emails this week. You're, you said that the Bible's not written to us. <clears throat> Just... Rewind the tape and hear me again. We're in a place where the intended purpose of that letter written by Paul to the Romans in the mid to early late first century, and these Romans are uh, individuals, both Jew and Gentile, that are occupying the land that was then. Uh, uh, and is still today considered to be the city of Rome, and the outskirts of Rome, the mission that he was endeavoring to embark upon with them and accomplish with them was to bring to them condemnation. That's the part that's weird for me. Because, you know, as I'm, as I'm teaching you, I want you to know what the Bible is saying, and I also don't want you to leave the room feeling condemned. Because, see, we're looking at this from the lens of an outsider, and we're looking at it from a perspective that we all, as believers, already have, and that is that we are redeemed, and that therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the important feature of that sentence is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when we take our time and slow down and read the Bible and we're focusing heavily on an area where Paul is intending to bring condemnation to his reader, it's easy for us to start feeling personally condemned. And I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to have that personal experience of leaving the room feeling condemned. But I also don't want to belittle, whitewash, soften the blow that Paul is after. And that is really to suggest that every one of us, whether we are redeemed or not, whether we are believers or not, that we are humble in the presence of God and recognize our sinful condition and therefore the need for a savior. And so I'm going to bring you condemnation today, but I want it to be academic. 
But the application that I want you to take from it is that you go away humbled in the presence of God and are thankful for the salvation that he alone has provided. And so keep those things in mind as we work our way through this because the intended purpose is to condemn so that the individual who feels condemned can then rest truly and fully and only in the grace of God, not in self, not in pride. And so the pur purpose of the discussion in the section that we're in in Romans 2, you can go there if you like, but we're going to start somewhere else. Um, is to provide the self-righteous and the hypocrite a rebuke. And so while I don't want you to be condemned, I want us to own it if the shoe fits. I want us to be aware of the fact that there is the potential for any one of us to be hypocritical, to recognize that our walk talks and our talk talks but our walk talks louder than our talk talks. You've heard that before from me. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. And there's a lot of talking. There's a lot of professing believers. And there are fewer possessing believers. And so how do I bring you a message today that is intended to bring you humility, a, an evaluation of your walk, of your heart, of your true condition in the Lord, and still send you away going, boy, are we happy we went to church today. Well, stay tuned. We'll, we'll go there together. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 10. Let's start there. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'm going to give you some backstory because um, if you read the New Testament and you don't know the Old Testament, the New Testament doesn't have quite the same meaning uh, as it will if you understand the Old Testament. Especially in this context because Paul will lead the Jewish persons that he is focusing on at this juncture in the letter uh, about their hearts, the condition of their hearts, and the covenants that they've enjoyed by being Jews, and even showing them that it is not an outward covenant that God was really after, but an inward covenant. God wanted the heart of men, not the physical frame of men, or not the outward rituals of men, but rather the deep and internal recesses of the heart as loyal to him. And so it's his work. And in the context of Deuteronomy 10, which is a revisiting of the law, we've already seen the law given, and now looking back in retrospect, uh, Moses is putting together a list of things in history lesson uh, and showing the children of Israel, in spite of their weakness and shortcoming, in, in spite of the fact that they have broken God's commandments, uh, they've had to been rewritten on uh, tablets hewn by Moses, the earlier tablets written by the finger of God broken, remember, when he came down from Mount Sinai. And now God is writing them again and revisiting with them again. And he is going to reiterate all the things that they already knew in the book of Deuteronomy, which is the whole purpose of the book. And I just want to pick up at verse 12 and see what the Lord is saying to Israel. So Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. By the way, isn't it nice to know that even the things that God tells us to do are for our good? Does it make God bigger, better, faster, stronger if we obey? It's for us. We should always keep that in mind. Indeed, verse 14, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, 
also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. And this is the key verse that I want to point out here. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. See, God was after the heart all along. Now, you're going to see this come up in Paul's letter to these Jews that are in Rome. And he's saying to them, I want you to be circumcised in the heart rather than just in the flesh. It's not the outward ritual. It's the inner man that God is after. And so this is not something new. God has already told this to Israel. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Why stiff-necked no longer? Well, they've been disobedient. In the history, by this time, they've already failed at Kadesh Barnea. They've been afraid of the giants in the land. They've gone into, and, and they've been working their way through processes with God, and they failed miserably on multiple occasions, grumbling against the Lord. And You brought us out here to die, and we're hungry, and we want something to eat, and he provides them man, and he provides them quail, and we're going to uh, thirst to death out here and he provides them water and he continually ministers to them over and over and over in his graciousness but still says look I don't want you to continue to be this way I want you to be more than those that are circumcised in the flesh I want you to be those that are circumcised in the heart I want your heart I want you to be humble in the presence of God for the Lord your God is a God of gods verse 17 and the Lord of lords and the great God mighty and awesome who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe by the way we come up to without partiality in Romans 2 we've already been there last week I'll mention it again he shows no partiality nor takes a bribe he administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger giving him food and clothing therefore love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt you shall fear the Lord your God and you shall serve him and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name by the way taking an oath in his name was that they were to swear to God now you have, again, poor theology in our modern world. Many people go to court today and uh, they refuse, if in the event that in certain courts, some don't do it anymore, but you put your hand on the Bible and say, I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. And a lot of Christians won't do that. Because they, they say, well, the Bible says we're not supposed to swear to God. No, quite to the contrary. What you're not supposed to do is swear to anything but God. That's what the law told them. See, they, they were swearing by the temple. They were swearing by the gold of the temple. That was their way of like putting their hand behind their back, crossing their fingers and saying, okay, I, I swear on the temple that I'll, I'll pay my debt. Well, they thought that, that by doing that, it was their you know, lesser swearing, not really swearing to God, where the God uh, of Israel, the only God, the only true and living God, as he makes himself very clear, is telling them, look, you shall be a person of your word. You shall swear as if it is before me. That's what Jesus was saying when he says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. He was saying, don't belittle this. Don't play around as if I can't see what you're actually doing. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done for you these great things and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude. A lot of discussion about... Uh, how many people came out of Egypt? Thousands. Uh, debated by some, but not by me. Uh, I think we can be very clear about the scriptures. Amen? Uh, go to Ezekiel for a minute. 36. Ezekiel 36. And uh, I'm going to just pick up reading a little bit here. Also for context, 
because it will relate as we work our way through Romans 2. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their ways was like, or their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. Now, of course, this is now post Deuteronomy. This is children of Israel. They have been uh, delivered from the land of Egypt. They've made their sojourn through the wilderness. They finally, the, the remnant of the people, entered into the land of Canaan and dealt with the Hittites and the Amorites and the, the uh, Hevites and the Jebusites. And they'd been subduing the land. And by going into the land, God had commanded them, by the way, also in the book of Deuteronomy, that when you enter the land, you shall not learn the way of the heathen. And yet they did. They were disobedient. They got involved in idolatry. They polluted the land. They called themselves the people of God. Their talk talked, but their walk did not talk. Their hearts were far from the Lord. Jeremiah rebuked him and said, this people draw near me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. What a grievous thing to have said. And see, this is all part of what Paul is going after in Romans 2 when he's trying to bring the axe to the root. He's trying to make them all aware. Look, you got nothing to be arrogant about. You need to be humble in the presence of God. In the last couple of weeks, we've already talked about judgmentalism, putting down others, thinking yourself better than others. Well, Paul is just still building on that and saying, look, you guys are hypocrites. It's worse than you're just judgmental. You're judgmental hypocrites. And he wants to point that out so that we will, they will not be such. If the shoe fits, we wear it. Amen? Again, I digress to my earlier thought. You're justified in Christ and there's therefore now no condemnation if you're a believer. But still, is there any possibility that we could put application on this for ourselves? And I think there is. I think there is. Don't want you to leave all feeling beat up, but do want you to leave feeling humble today. Amen? Because it'll have an effect on the way we serve others. It'll have an effect on the way we love others. Anyway, verse 18, Therefore I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. The blood that they had shed on the land at that time was child sacrifice. They were sacrificing their own children to Molech. It is no different than what is happening today in our world through what I will appropriately call child sacrifice in the subject of abortion. We sacrifice our children for pleasure, for power, for money, for ease. All the things that people have sacrificed their children for. And these are all idols in our lives. Now, again, I digress. If you've had an abortion, God loves you. If you've had an abortion, God forgives. If you haven't gone before the Lord and humbled yourself in his presence, I invite you to do that. But know this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You're a new creation in Christ. He doesn't hold your past against you. He forgives you and forgets your past so that you can go on in newness of life. But let's not whitewash or belittle or make small the real crimes of our day. And he goes on to say, so I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations, where, whomever or wherever they went, they profaned my holy name when they said of them, these are the people of the Lord and yet they have gone out of his land. See, by this time, they are in dispersion. They're under discipline. And so God has allowed the Assyrian Empire to scatter the northern tribes and Babylon to take captive the southern tribes. The people are in terrible condition. They're, all, they're scattered all over the face of the earth and not in the land of promise, not where they had been promised a blessing, uh, the milk, the honey, the, the, the beauty of being in the promised land. They had forfeited it by their own disobedience. 
I digress again. If you're a believer and you're in that promised land of the rest that he provides, if we walk in disobedience, it destroys that rest. It, it unsettles your life. It scatters you out into pain and anguish and displacement. And is it possible that a Christian can be disobedient to God and still suffer the consequences of their disobedience? Yes, now, in this life. Is it possible that God still chastens those that he loves? And the answer is yes. And so, of course, uh, the encouragement then is to walk in obedience and enjoy the blessing of God, the rest. Amen? Amen. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name when they said of them, well, who's they? They, the nations. Who's them? Israel. When the nations said of Israel, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God when I am hallowed in their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. And there I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And so God has made a promise to Israel of a final work of restoration for them, and that is still something that is in the future. Uh, your eyes will see it as a believer. You will see this, and you will be able to say, there is no other God but the God of Israel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, uh, who manifest himself into this world in the physical form of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, Jesus Christ himself. He is your Savior. He is your Deliverer. He is your Redeemer. He is the one that washes you and makes you clean and puts his Spirit within you. Amen? Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. This might make more sense to you now as we work our way through this quickly. We've already read through verses 1 through 16, talking about God's patience, forbearance, the allowance of sin in the world and why he allows it, and, uh, how he's waiting for the precious harvest of the earth. But now he focuses directly by naming the Jews on the Jews in Rome. Now, he's already been going in a Jewish uh, uh, pathway. He's already addressing the Jews, but now makes this quite specific when he says this. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. They should never have been resting on the law. They should have been resting in the grace, in the promises, in the blessings. But you are called a Jew and rest on the law and you make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. You're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in the darkness, instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. See, it's all outward for them. And they're arrogant and they're judgmental and they're putting down these that didn't have the law. You guys think you're a big deal because you have the covenant and the promises. And yes, it is a big deal because you're a peculiar people unto God. But God, I recall back to Deuteronomy, wanted the heart, not the outward ordinance. He wanted you to circumcise the flesh of your heart, if you will, rather than your own foreskin of the flesh. The sign of the covenant, certainly. Not putting it down, not belittling it. 
utilizing it in its proper context, but yet if you are circumcised from without and not circumcised from within, what's the point? And I'll come back to bring application to that. You are an instructor of the foolish, verse 20, a teacher of babes, having the form of the knowledge, form of knowledge of the truth of the law. Boy, you look at them, they, they're walking like, oh boy. Especially you see the Hasidic Jews today in their black robes and their long curls on the side of their hair and their pylacteries tied on their arm and their forehead. And, and they're, they're, you, know, you know why they wear black? Because they're mourning, because there's no Messiah. Messiah hasn't come yet. They won't wear colors because colors are uh, celebratory. Did you know that? See, they wear a yarmulke on their head because there's no temple, so there's no veil. And so the yarmulke symbolizes the veil. They can't be uncovered in the presence of God. Otherwise, God can, they're exposed to God that because there's no veil, they have the yarmulke. Men, take off your hat when you pray. See? Because that, 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 that head covering there is, is dishonoring, see? I won't get into all that right now. <laughs> culture, tradition, you know. But see, for the Jews, it's not just culture, tradition. It's actually a practice of the outward man, but their heart's still far from them. They've rejected their Messiah. Who is an antichrist but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? These people are antichrist. Now, the Jews in this context profess to be believers, and yet they're still so arrogant, and they need to be humbled. And Paul is building a case for, look, man, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's where we're going. We're going to get there eventually. But remember, we did a quick overview of chapter 2 and 3 to point that out, and now we're digging down a little bit into the text. You, therefore, he says, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? I mentioned the other day the parable of the hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crop. The sermon's mine until it's yours. I have to preach these sermons to myself all week long. They, I digest them, I think about them, I ponder them, I evaluate myself within the context of them, and then I come here and I stand before you and deliver the message to you, and it's your turn to own it. I own it, I still own it. But in this, in this context, Paul's calling these guys out. You guys say you know the law? You think that you're the, the light in, in a dark place? You guys are the ones that are going to give the direction to the blind? What are you doing? That's what he's after. He wants to bring them to the humility that they need before the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you guys. You who teach another... Do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? And they did. You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? They did. Notice that when the Jews brought the woman that was taken in adultery to Jesus and he wrote in the sand, you guys remember the story, where was the dude? He wasn't even there. Now we'll just get the woman, you know. The hypocrisy of it. The whole parable, that, or the whole story on the Mount of Beatitudes that you guys have heard many times, blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall inherit the kingdom and so forth. You go through the entire thing, if you read it in context, you realize that the first verse and the last verse are the most important parts of the sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And by the time he has gone through the list of all these things that leads you to that final idea, you shall therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, you might suggest that you then have accomplished verse 1. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because you say, I can't do it. That was the whole point. This is the whole point. The law, that was its whole point. To point out that men are sinful. That they need a savior. That you should be humble. That we should be humble. That they should be humble in the presence of God. You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? This context, I'll just give you, just because some of you guys love the scholarly nature of it. Um, some of the Jews in history, this is all Josephus and extra biblical, but they would go and they think that they were you know, going to tear down an idol temple. And when they found the gold and the silver and all the expensive jewelry or whatever they found in the idol's temple, they would take it and then they would go and sell it and so that they could have the money. And God had told them in the law not to do that, to destroy it all. Every bit of it had to be destroyed. 
and yet they kept it. They were stealing themselves. They were robbing idols' temples. There is also, of course, the application, and the Greek here uh, leaves a little bit of wiggle room, uh, that they robbed God. You know, remember in Malachi, he said, you have robbed God. And they said, where have you, re we robbed you. And he says, in your tithes and your offerings. And you're, not, you're not paying your tithes, you're not giving your offerings, or you give the least or the last or the worst. And God says, I can't take this. That's not from your heart. See, and so either way, the application is upon them. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? See, what happened to the Jews when they're scattered? They said among the nations, where is your God? Jeremiah. I didn't read that one to you, but that's what the book of Jeremiah records, that the nations will say, where is your God? Boy, can I put some personal application on this today? What kind of testimony do we have? People watch. I remember when I was in Bible school, I managed a video game arcade in Sunrise Mall in Citrus Heights, California. Some of you know it. So in the, in the mall there, I was the manager. I had a few people that worked there at the store, and I was able to go to Bible school and study all my, I did all my homework at work. My boss didn't care. As long as I was making him money, I could go in my office and do all my Bible studies, although he did tell me at one point, if you don't get your face out of that Bible, you're not going to be good for anything but to be a preacher. <clears throat> and so, anyway, I'm, I'm in Bible school, and, and everybody in the mall knew, because we used to do drugs in the back room, and uh, it was a, I was a crazy kid, you know, young kid at the time, and uh, uh, then I got saved, and everybody knew I got saved, because I wasn't abusing drugs with them anymore, I wasn't running around with them anymore. And uh, so they were watching me, and I remember one day I was standing out in the mall just kind of taking a break. And, you know, malls are funny places. They used to be busy places, not so much. But uh, now I was standing out in the mall, I was kind of relaxing in summer, girl with these really super, super tight, really super, super short white shorts comes rolling by. And being a man of God, as I mentioned a couple of days ago on something else, I allowed myself to, without consciousness, watch her go by and I was leaning on the wall and here she comes through the front doors of the mall and I mean those are the hottest shortest tightest whitest shorts I ever saw and I watched and she came through and my eyes continued watching I watched continually all the way down till I stepped out from the doorway of them looked and by this time, several of the mall employees that were watching me watch her started laughing and applauding. <clears throat> because, see, your walk, walk, talks louder than your talk, talks. The name of God, verse 24, is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. And again, that verse is such an interesting verse because it's a conglomerate. It's the, the author here, Paul, has taken all kinds of pieces from the Old Testament and put it in quotes and created his own sentence. And so it's a, it's a summary sentence as it was written. And that's why we read it this way, but still you see it in your Bible, some of you italicized and in quotes. He's giving a summary. The name of God is blasphemed. Where is your God? You're out of your land. You're not enjoying the things God has given you. What happened to you guys? I thought you had this covenant with God. And then goes on to say, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? In other words, God is saying, look, I'm looking at the heart. You can have all the externals, but if your heart's not right, you're still not right. And now he goes on to say, will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. In other words, look, you're not a Jew because just simply by the fact that you go through the rituals, it's of their heart. 
He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit. Now, it's capitalized in your Bible, and it shouldn't be. Uh, it should read in spirit, not in the spirit. Uh, the word pneuma is used, but there is no definite article, ho, which is the. So it would read correctly in the Greek, in spirit, not in the spirit, which is why the uh, translators have capitalized it. So it's, it's not about the flesh, it's about the spirit, it's about the inner man, it's about the real you. He is not a Jew who is one inwardly, or circumcision is that of the heart, for, uh, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So you want to have praise from God, then you're walking from the heart. Now, again, I want to tell you, he's talking to Jews. He's not saying if a Gentile gets circumcised that they are going to become Jews. Uh, if, that if a person just believes in their heart as a believer in the church age and they're a Christian uh, in the church age that you are now a Jew. No, that's not what he's talking about. Now, there was a proselyte, a, a law of the proselyte under the old covenant where a Gentile would become a Jew by religious standards. But they voluntarily did that from the heart and then went through the outward rituals. But if a person just went through the outward rituals, whether Jew or Gentile, and it was only outward, they're no Jew. They had no real relationship with God. God says, I want you to be humble in my presence. I want you to love me with your heart. Remember Deuteronomy. He, the, he, he spelled it out from the very beginning. And so, where does this come to application for us? I got four points <clears throat> that I'll bring to you. They're not on the screen today, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I got to these a little late this week. Uh, so, understanding the context, and we'll pick up on this as we continue into chapter three with some review of chapter two as it'll bring application. But let's, let's put the onus upon us. Number one. Knowing more than those around us may not improve our walk or deepen our spirituality. Now it's on you, okay? Knowing more than those around us may not improve our walk or deepen our spirituality. You come to church because you like to hear the teaching, but what do you do with it? You want to it, it be taught? Good, let's apply within, amen? Amen. Let us, let us learn the things that God has intended for us and take them home with us and throughout the week live by these things that we learn. Not just go, hey, I'm, I'm stimulated academically. Sure, I want you to be stimulated, stimulated academically. That's why I teach you. <clears throat> but I don't teach you just for your academics. I teach you so that you can have the knowledge that God has intended for you to obtain, therefore translated into your heart. The old saying, the problem is it's nine, nine inches long from the head to the heart. This is where we could become Pharisees. We become lofty. We know a lot of stuff. And then we can become judgmental of others. Number two. This one um, is an adaption of Abraham Lincoln's quote who they sometimes will suggest somebody else wrote, but you can fool all the people some of the time. You guys have heard this before. And some of the people some of the time. That was Abraham Lincoln, here's my part. But you can fool God none of the time. God knows. And see, this goes into that illustration. What about the church age? What about circumcision? What does all that mean to us? Hey, we have a sort of ritual that we go through. Uh, we call it water baptism. Believer's baptism. You're baptized in water as an outward show of an inward act. You're testifying to what's happened. But you know how many people, guys, this is for somebody else, not for you. How many people have been baptized how many people attend church? How many people tithe? How many people go through all of the routines of serving or whatever it is they do, and yet their heart's still far from God? Hey, man, just getting baptized in water doesn't save you. It's an outward sign. And there's a lot of people that are professing believers that are not possessing believers. We need to be cautious. Number three. 
The testimony of the saint is observable. Man looketh upon the outside. We, uh, we love to quote that. Man looketh on the outside, but God looketh upon the heart. And so we, we think, well, the outside really doesn't matter then. Oh, but it does. Man looketh on the outside. Sure, God knows your heart, but what about man? Do you know what the whole book of James is written about? Justification before men, not before God. See, if you thought that, that James was saying that a man, therefore, is justified by works, not by faith only, applies to your justification between you and God, that, that vertical justification that Paul talks about and says a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, you would think James and Paul were in an argument in the Bible. But that's not the case. The book of James is horizontal. He's saying, look, the way you live in front of others matters. You see then that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. You call yourself a believer, act like it. You guys still love me, by the way? <laughs> Number four and finally, God will judge according to truth, not a assumption or appearance. Verse 11 in this chapter says God judges all men without partiality. And in verse 16 we read that God judges by the man Christ Jesus. And that leaves you in a, a, a very peculiar place. You have to know if you're in Christ. Because if you are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation to you. But if you're not, you're in trouble. And believer, if you're not walking the way you should, you're not entering into his rest. Enter. Don't strive with God. Don't fight with God. My spirit shall not always strive with man, God said in uh, Genesis. There's so much misery in the church there's so much depression in the church there's so much problem in believers today and i i want to tell you there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of the reasons at times is when we're just walking in disobedience and we're not living in surrender before the lord and you know god's ultimately going to win for his own namesake not for you for his namesake he said that Remember that? That was of Israel. Same thing will apply to you and me. He writes his law in our hearts and causes us to walk in his statutes. And so he's going to work it out in you one way or the other. I say let's work now with him instead of against him and enter into the joy and the rest he has provided us. Let us be a humble people. Let us be a non-judgmental people. And again, I'm talking to the choir. You guys are believers. You've been washed in the blood. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so you can really, really know that you don't have to leave here feeling miserable today. But if the shoe does fit, let's wear it. If there's something on, going on in your life that's making you out to be a hypocrite, and if there's something in your life making you out to be the judgmental one that is putting down others and, not, and, and thinking you're better than someone else, stop it. Wait, we just can't stop it. We have to have therapy for 16 weeks. No, you don't. Because you already know. God's already talking to you. Amen. Amen.